Lee, thank you everyone for tuning into our session tonight. Hope you guys get a lot of value out of this. Uh, so today we're focusing on energy saving hacks for renters and I'll dive straight in. So a little bit about me. My name's Aki. I work at Sapien. Sapien is a company that exists to make homes more energy efficient. Um, I started it up back in 2017 with a few friends. We were all very sort of um, interested in sustainability and energy efficiency and had a bit of an entrepreneurial bent. And we kind of put our heads together and um, decided that making houses more energy efficient would be a really cool business to start. And uh, our primary focus uh, then and still today to a certain extent is draft proofing, um, which is a great one for renters to focus on because it's really accessible in terms of DIY options and it can make a massive impact on the thermal performance of your home. So on the agenda for today, uh, we've got a few items. We're going to do a quick overview of the whole energy efficient home retrofit journey and what are the steps in that journey. We're also going to touch on what renter's rights are, what modifications you can make with or without the permission of your rental provider and some really cool rebates that are being made available. And then at the end, we're going to dive into my favorite draft proofing DIY tips and tricks, where we share with you a lot of the stuff that we've learned over the years, what to look for and how to fix it. So really pumped for that. Uh, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. All right. So bit of a mouthful. What is the energy efficient home retrofit journey. It's made up of eight key steps. The first four steps are our passive steps. So minimizing the energy that our home needs to run up front. And then the final four points there are more active um, elements of, of the journey, things that are actually drawing electricity actively. Um, this order isn't a hard and fast rule. It is roughly uh, laid out in an order that makes sense on the screen, starting with draft proofing, moving to lighting, insulation, windows, then looking at our active elements. Um, and the reason for this order will sort of start to make sense as we talk about each of these items. Um, but generally, we do want to, as a rule of thumb, focus on, on our passive items first and reduce our upfront kind of energy requirements of the home. Um, and then move on to our other items. But obviously, if the hot water breaks and it's time to replace it or that kind of thing, we don't always have to follow this uh, order too strictly. So why would we begin the energy retrofit journey? There's three key reasons. The number one reason we get called out to people's places is they want to improve their thermal comfort. Um, they're sitting at home, particularly in winter, we get a lot of calls. They, they can't keep the house warm. They feel that cold draft coming in and they want to be more comfortable. Um, and that's a great reason to dive into the energy retrofit journey. Second really good reason is it's going to reduce your energy bills. Your home is going to use a lot less energy to run, which is cheaper for you. Um, and that feeds into our third um, item, certainly not our least important item, which is reducing your carbon footprint, which is a great thing to do, especially in the face of the climate crisis that we are facing today. So first item on the list and my favorite is draft proofing. So air leak can account for up to 25% of summer heat gain and winter heat loss in Aussie homes, which is uh, massive. Now, there's a few additional benefits to draft proofing uh, on top of what I just laid out for the home energy retrofit journey in general. Um, often we find it's going to improve acoustic separation. We get a lot of good feedback on that when we draft proof houses that are on busy roads or near sports fields that they find it a lot quieter and more still inside. We're also going to get reduced ingress of dust and bugs and we're also going to reduce our air change rate during high pollution events. So if, um, you know, a bushfire event where we've got smoke particles in the air or a thunderstorm asthma event, um, we're reducing the amount of that polluted air that's entering into the home. Um, I'm going to park draft proofing there for a minute and we'll come back to it uh, in a bit more detail at the end when we look at our kind of DIY options. But draft proofing is typically your sort of first step in the journey and, and your biggest kind of bang for your buck um, in terms of passive improvements to the home. 
Next on the list is lighting. Um, so unfortunately, very common in Aussie homes is the halogen downlights. These use a lot more electricity than efficient LEDs that you can get today. Um, that's not the only reason that they are bad. They also are typically a ventilated fitting because that globe gets hot. This allows air leakage from the ceiling space to the occupied area. Typically, the temperature in our ceiling or roof space is undesirable, and so that air leakage is also undesirable uh, and not something that we want. Um, the other effect that they have is there are clearance requirements required in Australian standards uh, for safety when it comes to insulation coverage. And I've got a little screen grab from the Australian standards there on the right, um, showing that we need to have a clearance free from any insulating material around that recessed downlight. Um, and this can be a big degrading factor when it comes to our insulation. And I've got a image there in the middle. Uh, that's from our thermal imaging camera. And you can see around that downlight, there's an insulation bat missing and some other insulation taken out. Unfortunately, with this, um, a small loss in insulation has a disproportionate negative impact on the performance of the insulation overall. So there's a couple of different studies on this, but the sort of numbers that get thrown around is that a 10% loss in in coverage of insulation, so we're only missing 10% here, can result in a 30 to 50% drop in the um, performance of that insulation. So we really want to focus on getting good insulation coverage and minimizing um, thermal bridging. Um, and so this is kind of why lighting crops up very early on in the home energy retrofit journey is because of the run-on effects to other super important elements like ceiling insulation. So what can we do about it? Um, for renters, you, we can replace it with LED globes. And this is something that you actually don't require permission from your rental provider to do. For homeowners or for people who um, want to have a conversation with their rental provider about more wholesale changes, it's a good idea to replace them with sealed IC4 rated LED fittings. So the IC4 rating means we can lay insulation right over the top of this um, LED. So we're not getting that thermal bridging and they're sealed fitting. So they're going to have a lot less air leakage than the older style ventilated down lights. Um, so that's pretty much it for lighting. A lot of info there, hopefully um, not bombarding you too much, but we'll move straight on to insulation. So once we've got those lights sorted, we want to start looking at insulation. We've already talked about the disproportionate effect of gaps in insulation on the performance of that insulation. In the top right there, I've got another thermal imaging camera shot from one of our audits uh, where you can see the ceiling there is very patchy. Unfortunately, this is um, reasonably common where there's just lots of insulation missing. We've got lots of thermal bridging there. So something we definitely want to get on top of. We are typically going to go for R5 climate. The R is basically a metric for the ability of the insulating material to resist heat transfer through that material. So the higher it is, the more it's going to resist heat transfer. So higher is better. Um, so R5 is a really solid target to go for, um, which is, you know, above minimum requirements, which are 3.5. Um, more would be better. You can go certainly go higher than R5, um, but you do start to see diminishing returns and it just becomes a question of perhaps that budget could be better spent elsewhere. Um, so something to consider there. But ceiling insulation is generally our number one priority when it comes to looking at insulation. Um, you can see on the graphic there in the middle, it accounts for 25 to 35% of our winter heat losses and our summer heat gain. So a really important one there. Um, walls is sort of next on the list where we've got 15 to 25% of our heat transfer coming through walls. These are a bit more of a tricky one to retrofit, but there are some good blow in wall insulation, um, providers on the market where basically they'll make a sort of 50 cent hole, um, cut out in either the plasterboard or the weatherboard or even brick, and they can blow wall insulation in between all of the noggins. So you end up with a bunch of little holes, which get patched up afterwards. 
Um, and this can be a really good way to retrofit um, wall insulation into a home. Um, this is one where you'd need to engage a professional. Something like ceiling insulation, it's possible to do DIY, um, you know, as long as you do a bit of research and check the manufacturer's instructions and make sure you're leaving appropriate clearances for services and that kind of thing. It is actually something that can be done in a DIY situation, probably something you'd want to check in with the rental provider um, before you lay some bats down, but it is one that people can do themselves, um, unlike wall insulation. Uh, a good trick to tell if you have wall insulation insulation. Um, if you take great care, uh, you can actually remove a power outlet off the wall. You usually just tell it with a couple of little screws and have a little look in the wall and see if there's any insulation around that power outlet. Um, good idea to switch off um, the circuit breaker on your switchboard just to be on the safe side and take care, great care whenever you're doing something like this. But it is a neat little trick for just having a little look in the wall. For underfloor, a uh, really good product is R2.5 polyester rolls. So in the bottom right image, you can see there we've got R2.5 polyester rolls. Basically, these get rolled out in between the joists and staple gunned into the side. So they're held in there really robustly. Um, vermin doesn't like polyester. Moisture doesn't like polyester. So it's a really solid product. Um, there are other ways to do it, but it's important to kind of take great care and do research when you're looking at underfloor insulation, things like trying to strap on bats or use some kind of netting to hold bats and stuff can often um, end pretty poorly uh, in terms of coverage and creating air pockets and also just not very robust for sort of long-term um, performance if it does start to fall apart. Um, while floors are responsible for a little bit less heat transfer than walls. In terms of cost benefit, it's probably going to make sense to look at underfloor first because getting wall insulation done is expensive. Also, underfloor insulation is another one where you can do DIY following the manufacturer's instructions. It's not particularly complicated to install R2.5 polyester rolls, so another great one for our um, DIY heroes at home. All right, next on our journey, we're looking at windows. So few really good options for renters in terms of um, window coverings and, and temporary films. Um, one that we've come across is Renshade. We've got that in the bottom left image there. In fact, I might even get my little uh, laser pointer. So in this image in the left down here, um, we've got Renshade. This is actually my bedroom window. Um, Basically, it's just a perforated metal foil and it's held on with four little Velcro dots and it does a really good job in summer of reflecting all of that radiant heat back outside so that we're not getting so hot in the middle of summer when we're trying to keep the house cool and you can remove them for winter when it actually becomes desirable to get that sun and radiant heat into the home. Another really cool option for renters is this kind of bubble wrap, quote unquote, double glazing. So. In these images on the right, up here is the window before, uh, and down here is the window after some bubble wrap has been applied to it. Again, this is just one of my windows at home. So really easy to apply. And if you've got some bubble wrap lying around, it's a great way to put it to work. Basically, you just need to spray a little bit of water on the window, just a light film of water, and that bubble wrap is just gonna stick to it and stay there. Um, and so we got that still air gap in the bubbles. We get a great insulating effect. Um, really good in winter when we don't want our heat to escape. And a good idea in summer as well, um, if we've got our cooling running, um, that heat isn't going to penetrate through and conduct through that window quite as quickly. Um, so a really good little option for renters and something that's easily removable. Next thing I want to talk about is cellular blinds. So in these kind of images in the top left here, I've got a couple of photos of cellular blinds. Um, the great thing about cellular blinds, if it might be a little bit difficult to see, but you can see as that blind is opened, you've got these sort of hexagonal shapes um, tessellating down. So again, we're getting our still air gap, which is a really good insulator. Um, and in the image on the left, if we can get it snug from frame to frame, these are some of the best performing blinds on the market um, 
for yeah for the heat transfer for, for thermal performance um only downside is they're really only working when they're actually closed not when they're open unlike something like ren shade and bubble wrap um but yeah really solid option um uh, one thing to be mindful of is maybe not going straight to the cheapest options and checking the reviews you can see in this image in the sort of center top that some of these um cells have actually started to stretch a little bit so you want to get a nice robust blind that's not going to just stretch um, in a month or two so check the reviews and do a bit of research before you buy then last on the list here um is secondary glazing so this is a sort of cheaper and less wasteful alternative to double glazing um it's not going to quite hit the same performance of double glazing where you've got that evacuated space between two glasses two pieces of glass or, or filled with an inert gas um with secondary glazing it's more of a retrofit option where we're adding an additional acrylic pane to an existing window with a little spacer in between them so we're kind of getting that still air gap um and that that benefit that we would see with double glazing um but at a bit of a lower price point um and without having to get rid of any um existing glazing um that's one you definitely want to probably have a chat to the landlord about um oh and the other one on the list that i skipped is just sort of window films more generally um with a few different kind of window films it's important to do your research um there are some options out there like say a low emissivity window film which is going to be really great in summer at reflecting light back out um but if it's a permanent film it's going to be detrimental in winter and so that where we actually want that radiant heat coming into the home so the cost benefit there is sometimes not fully squaring up um so just important to do your research when you're looking at any window films and of course any permanent window films need to be discussed with the rental provider all right, that's a lot about windows. Now, external shading. In terms of um, preventing the home heating up in summer, external shading is generally going to be um, higher performing than internal shading and that kind of thing. If we can stop that radiant heat entering the home in the first place, um, then that's great and we don't need to deal with it. So a few options. Planting deciduous plants is always a great idea. So we're talking about plants that are nice and leafy in the summer when we want to block that sun uh, and lose all of their leaves in the winter. Uh, important to note for renters that you generally do need to talk to the rental provider if you're making changes to the garden, but I would hazard that this is one that generally they are fairly amenable to, depending on um, how precious they are about the current state of their garden, garden and the, the landscape there. But these have a few benefits. We've got the shading. They also provide some local cooling just throw through the evapotranspiration effect. Uh, and with increased foliage, we're also getting reduced wind speeds, which is going to reduce heat transfer into or out of the home, depending on the time of year. When we're looking at north-facing windows, fixed horizontal shading is a really great solution um, because we've got that high uh sun angle in summer and that low sun angle in winter we can capitalize on this with properly designed shading and there's an example uh in the bottom right here where this eave coming out is blocking the uh so it's providing shade in summer when we've got that high sun angle but it's letting that low angle winter sun in in winter when we want it so we can also do the same with louvers like in the center image so fixed horizontal shading is always a great idea for north facing windows for east and west, because we've got that um, high variability in sun angle within a single day, we really need adjustable shading to be able to deal with that. All right, moving on to heating and cooling. So heating and cooling is basically our biggest active energy spend. It accounts for about 40% of household energy use. There's a few things to consider here if you're in a property um that could be due for new or replaced heating and cooling the first thing we want to think about is central versus space heating and cooling so when we're talking about central we're talking about our you know our ducted heating or our ducted air conditioning where we've got our big unit somewhere in the roof underfloor outside and we're ducting um to grills that are all throughout the house. So that's our central systems. When we're talking about space heating and cooling, we're talking about 
individual units in each room. Something like a split system is really the most common example of space heating and cooling, where we're just heating or cooling that individual space. Typically, our space heating and cooling is going to use less energy than our central systems. Um, primarily, we've just got um, the big benefit from being able to heat individual spaces more effectively with space heating and cooling. So if you're just in the bedroom or just in the living room, you can focus on just heating or cooling that space. There's also a few kind of inherent issues with ducted systems that are important to be aware of. With a ducted system, we're usually going to get a bit of air leakage um, through those duct fittings. And if there's any damage over time, we're, we've got a source of air leakage there. We're also going to get heat losses through the ducting itself. So if you think about all of the surface area of a duct network under the house or in the ceiling, we're going to get some heat transfer through those. Even though they are insulated ducts, there's still going to be some heat transfer there that's undesirable. They also are generally going to have higher fan energy use than space heating and cooling options because that fan has got to work to push air through that network of ducts. Um, and if there's any air leakage in that system, it's got to work even harder. So a few things to consider there with ducted systems. When we're looking at the type of system in terms of its energy source, there's a few options to consider. Our basic kind of electric heaters are typically sort of the least efficient, like this talking like an electric element style heater. Um, often they're going to use up to five times more energy than a reverse cycle equivalent. Um, so these are generally should be avoided, um, although for renters, if you're struggling, there are sort of little portable heaters and that kind of thing. Um, and if we're comparing using a little portable heater in one room compared to perhaps a less efficient central system heating up a whole house, maybe it doesn't square up so badly. But typically, we do want to steer away from these kind of options. Um, next, we want to compare sort of our gas, so our typical gas ducted system versus a reverse cycle system. Um, gas, generally we wanna be moving away from gas just from a basic emissions factor. Um, it's a fossil fuel, so it's inherently unsustainable. Whereas reverse cycle uses electricity, which the Victorian grid is um, becoming greener with time. Um, and also we can use solar power if we've got solar panels on the roof to power our reverse cycle, which we cannot do with gas. There's also some really cool studies that have come out um, that Re Renew Magazine has done um, comparing gas and reverse cycle. And basically, if you're looking at getting a new gas versus reverse cycle system for heating, reverse cycle wins out on life cycle cost and also with greenhouse gas emissions. So we're really kind of pushing towards that reverse cycle um, split systems in homes, really. Also wanted to mention evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling um, on the face of it is a really energy efficient option, especially in houses that don't thermally perform that well, because all we've got there really is a fan and a little water pump. Um, so they're not very intensive. They may struggle a bit with the higher temperatures or the higher humidities. Um, and also they are a big source of air leakage, typically, not always, but generally they're a big source of air leakage when they're not running because an evaporative cooling system uses outside air. Um, they've got that direct outside air connection. Often we find a lot of air leakage coming in through evaporative cooling systems. Um, they're also a centrally ducted system. So yeah, when, when we look at evaporative cooling versus say a reverse cycle split system, um, for an inefficient house, evaporative cooling is typically going to use less energy when it's on. But as our house gets more and more efficient, a reverse cycle system, which recirculates air, in the house is actually going to start to pull out ahead of our evaporative cooling system. Um, so there's there's different considerations there when we're looking at evaporative cooling. The lowest energy option for cooling is always going to be fans. Unfortunately, they're also the least effective, but if you can um, get the cooling that you need just from a simple fan, then that's definitely the way to go. All right, so moving on to the next kind of section of our presentation. Um, what are the sort of rental laws that affect renters? We had a bunch of new awesome laws come into effect in March 2021 with a bunch of modifications that renters can provide without the rental provider's consent. So LED light globes we already talked about, do not need the rental provider's consent to install them as long as you're not putting a new fitting in. 
um, low flow shower heads and any non-permanent window film for insulation, reduced heat transfer or privacy. So that's all systems go for Renshade or our kind of bubble wrap, um, bubble wrap double glazing, which are non-permanent. Then we've also got some other items where your rental provider must have a reasonable reason to refuse certain modifications. This includes ones that are necessary to increase the thermal comfort or reduce the energy and water usage costs for the property. So all of the stuff we've been talking about. And they also specifically mention draft proofing in homes without open fluid gas heating, including installing weather seals, caulking, gap filling around windows, doors, skirting, and floorboards. So that's that's great news for our draft proofing DIY heroes. The rental provider has to, has, a, have to, has to have a reasonable reason to refuse these modifications. There's also some really great info at Environment Victoria for renters where they've got some good letter templates um, that you can use to write a letter to your rental provider um, talking about how it benefits them. Um, when it comes to different options like insulation and draft roofing and that kind of thing. So a useful resource there that's worth checking out. All right. Uh, from the 29th of March in last year now, windows in rooms likely to be used as bedrooms or living areas must be fitted with curtains or blinds that can be closed, block light and provide privacy. Um, so if you're renting in a home that doesn't have these, it's a good opportunity to um, kick off with a good energy efficient option like the cellular blinds. Also from the 29th of March, 2021, rental properties uh, must have a fixed heater, not a portable one in good working order in the main living area. And following on from that, from the 29th of March this year, the heater must also meet energy efficiency standards. So if you're looking at moving places or entering into a new agreement that's going to occur after or from the 29th of March, um, then they must have a fixed energy efficient heater in the main living area. If they have a fixed heater that is not energy efficient, the rental provider has to upgrade it to an energy efficient one. And there's a few um, kind of guidelines around what that constitutes. Generally, it has to be above a two-star rating at least to be considered energy efficient. So really good information there for anyone who's looking at entering a rental agreement after the 29th of March. All right, a few really cool rebates available for renters. So this is a solar panel rebate specifically for rental properties. Um, basically, the rebate was still going to go to the, the rental provider who's going to pay for the solar panels, but your rental provider can apply for a rebate of up to $1,400 on the cost of installing a solar system. Uh, and they also have the option to apply for an interest-free loan to match that rebate amount. Um, and then on the website at solar.vic.gov.au. They've got info um, for renters and they've also got a solar for rentals email template, which you can use and send it to your rental provider to start that conversation about accessing this rebate that's for rental properties um, and getting solar panels installed. Within that um, sort of contracted information they provide, there's an option for renters. If you really want to sweeten the deal and get those solar panels in, there's an option for renters to agree to contribute up to 50% of the monthly repayment cost of the interest-free loan as a further incentive uh, to get them to take advantage of the offer. Uh, this equates to a maximum amount of $14.58 per month. Um, so you can't be asked to contribute more than that for the solar panel system. Um, and on the website, they've always got um, how many rebates remain for this release. They're released pretty regularly. Um, I checked last night and there's 2,200 ready to go. So um, get them while they're hot and have a talk to your rental provider. Um, another rebate, solar hot water. We've got a 50% rebate of up to $1,000 on eligible solar hot water and heat pump hot water systems. So good idea again to reach out to your rental provider, see if they're eligible and maybe get on board with this. Heat pump hot water systems are great. They're really efficient. Solar hot water systems are also great. Uh, the only thing to consider there is that a solar hot water system is probably, well, it is going to require some kind of booster for winter when there's not that much radiant heat from the sun to heat the water up. Uh, and they're also going to take up some of that roof real estate which could also be used for solar panels. So um, you might, might, depending on how much real estate there is on the roof, it might be better to get a bigger solar panel system that would power an electric heat pump 
rather than solar hot water with a booster, but there's just um, different considerations there for that. All right, now we're getting into the uh, nitty gritty of draft proofing and all the stuff that you can get started with at home. Um, after a, a quick chat to your rental provider. So what are we looking for and how can we fix it? And how do we actually find drafts in our homes? So the way we do it at Sapien is we would use a blower door in this image on the left. So basically it's a big fan. It sucks air out of the house that depressurizes the house a little bit. Um, and because of that negative pressure, the house is going to be sucking air in from outside. So we can go through room by room and you can actually feel where that air is coming in on like your skin on the back of your hand. You can feel around skirting, around windows, floorboards, architraves, all kinds of things. And if you can feel that air coming in, then that's a source of air leakage or draft in the home that needs to be um, considered and dealt with. So you guys probably don't have blower doors lying around at home, but that's totally fine because there's a really cool way you can do this um, without a blower door. Not quite to the same effect, but it's generally pretty effective. If you go around your house and switch on all of your extractor fans, your kitchen exhaust, your bathroom exhaust, um, often this is enough to create that negative pressure, that suction to draw air in from outside through all the sources of air leakage in your home. Um, and then you can go around and do a bit of a draft treasure hunt. Uh, and see where you can feel that air leakage coming in. And often it's quite distinct and you'd be surprised at, at how clearly you can feel it um, depending on the size, size of the property you're in and how strong the fans are. But often, yeah, you can really feel it just doing this. Uh, it's a really fun exercise. You could even do it straight after this presentation. Um, so now what are we actually looking for once we get that negative pressure? All right, so we've got a few things here. Um, for our draft proofing DIY heroes, there's a lot of corking on the agenda. If you don't know what corking is, I've got a picture here of one of our um, amazing employees doing some corking there. So he's got his corking gun. You can get these from your local hardware store and some sealant there. And he's corking a join between the wood and the brick there. So when I say corking, this is what I'm talking about. We're going around with a corking gun and some kind of sealant. There are a few different types. Happy to talk about that if anyone has any questions. Um, but yeah, this is what we're referring to when we say corking. So what do we want to cork? All kinds of things. Um, we've got ducted heating vents. So in this image in the bottom left, this is a really common one for ducting heating systems. Um, around the plenum box there, which feeds the ducted heating grill, the grill has been removed in these photos. Um, we've got all of these gaps, which go straight through to the floor. So we just want to cork around all of those gaps. And then we can put the ducted heating grill back in and we've dealt with the air leakage coming in around that. So really good option for caulking. We've also got plumbing fittings. So up here, we've got a drain pipe. You find this under the sink in the bathroom or the kitchen. On the left is our before. We've got, got that big gap around the plumbing fitting. Um, we often get a lot of air leakage around these. And so again, we just want to caulk around that, get that nice and airtight. Um, also light fittings. So for our sort of suspended light fittings. We're not talking about down lights here. Don't cork your down lights. Um, but for our sort of suspended light fittings, often you can just drop the cover down. Again, make sure it's off, take great care. But if the cables are sheathed and everything's looking safe, often you can just cork around the hole in the plaster that those cables come through, which is a source of air leakage, and then slide the, um, the cover of the light back up um, and you're good to go. So there's a few options there. Next on our corking agenda is skirting and floorboards. So skirting, again, is a really common one where we get a lot of air leakage coming through the wall space. Wall spaces are not airtight cavities. Generally, they're going to open somehow into the roof or under floor. And so we're ultimately getting air from outside coming in through those. So in the bottom right here where I've got the laser pointer, we've got a big gap um, under that skirting. And we want to get that corked up. So we've got an example of skirting that's been corked um, just up here in the top right image. Floorboards, um, another common source of air leakage. So failing the um, our switching on all of our extractor fans, another good way to work out which floorboards are your problem floorboards is going around with a strong torch. Uh, and so this one you can actually see straight through to the ground. And yeah, you'll find that if you go around with the torch, you'll be able to see which ones where that light's actually going straight through. So we know we need to cork that one. 
um, in the bottom left here, we've got a corked floorboard um, and we've just used a clear sealant there. So you can hardly even see it really. You can either go clear or you can try to color match the floorboards with some sort of wood colored cork. There's lots of options, um, but that's one to look for. All right, we've also got permanent wall vents. Now, one really important thing to note here is the purpose of these wall vents. So these are from homes that have open fireplaces or open flue gas heaters where by Australian standards, the, the building code, um, you're required to have some form of fixed ventilation um, in homes that have those open fireplaces or open fluid gas heaters. So basically a, a big heating system that the combustion reaction is burning the oxygen that's inside the home. It's not pulling it from outside. So they're a safety feature. Uh, and so if you do have a fireplace, a, a open fireplace or any kind of open flue heating, um, then you'd wanna leave these alone. It's also one um, definitely to have a chat to the landlord about before you go blocking these up. Um, but if the chimneys are sealed or, or you don't, these these um, open fireplaces and open flue gas heaters don't exist in your home anymore, generally you can um, seal these up, but take great care. But we've got sort of an unblocked one on the left. And then this is after some caulking. Um, and this is a um, sealant that dries. It goes out, goes on milky. So you can see what you're doing and then it'll dry clear. So that's it while it's still a bit wet. And once that's dry, you can't really see it at all. Other thing we want to look for, super common one, is along the tops of architraves. So in this bottom right image, we're looking on top of a window, I believe. Um, but on top of windows and doors, if you've got a little step ladder, just hop up and have a look. Often there's a big gap there. Um, and we want to cork that up because usually there's going to be air leakage coming through that. Super common one. Um, the other one that we often get is in houses that have aluminium frames, whether it's for windows, doors, sliding doors, and that kind of thing. We often have this gap in between the frame and the wood. And so we want to cork that up as well. We want to get that sealed because we often get air leakage through there. All right, charging ahead to kitchen extracts. Um, so over here in this kind of top left image, we can see a kitchen extract. Um, what we can generally do here, this top metal sheath is usually just held in with a couple of little screws. We can undo those to drop this metal sheathing and expose the ductwork underneath, which is what we're seeing in the other images. Usually what you'll find is a fair bit of clearance around those ducts. Um, so in this bottom image, bottom right image, we've got a big clearance around the duct. And in the left, we're showing that corked. Then in this top image, you can see a big cutout in the plaster. And then in this sort of center image, you can see we've taped up around that. So this is kind of the segue into the next product that we use a lot of, which is air barrier tape. Um, you can find it online, um, really good stuff. And it, it's really handy for a range of different kind of draft proofing things, generally ones that are out of sight. Um, but yeah, so we've used air barrier tape there to seal up that kitchen extract. Another really big one is behind ovens and dishwashers. Um, so we do want to take great care whenever we're pulling out an oven or a dishwasher. Ovens are typically easier to pull out than dishwashers. They're generally just held in with two little screws and then they slide straight out of the cabinetry and you can put it gently on the floor and have a look at what's going on. This top right image is what we found behind an oven that we pulled out um, in the last couple of months. And we can see a big hole into the wall space where we were getting a ton of air leakage. And then in the left there, we've gone with our trusty air barrier tape um, to seal that up. And then we've just put the oven straight back in and screwed it back to the cabinetry. This center image and this bottom left image is what we found behind two different dishwashers. Um, dishwashers, again, are generally just screwed into the cabinetry. Um, generally, it's a good idea to Google your type of dishwasher and see how they're fixed before you want to pull it out. There's a li little bit more on the advanced side of DIY, but that's okay for our more daring DIY heroes. Um, another thing to be careful of is just as you're pulling the dishwasher out, you want to make sure that the drain and supply um, water hoses that feed your dishwasher have enough slack because um, sometimes, especially with all the dishwashers, they can be a bit brittle. Um, you definitely don't want to break those. So just take great care when you're pulling that out. Um, and it's not a bad idea to isolate the water supply as well with a little tap under the sink and switch off the power to your dishwasher before you pull it out. But again, we often find really big holes behind dishwashers and big sources of air leakage. Um, air barrier tape is usually going to do well. Corking along the back edge is usually going to do well. 
For this one, we also slapped a bit of ply. I believe that dishwasher had a foot that needed to sit on that piece of ply. So we also added that after putting some foam or air barrier tape in the hole. Um, but yeah, there's some sneaky ones that people don't um, necessarily see. And I might wrap it up in a minute. So we got time for some more questions, but I just two really big ones that I wanted to address. Um, and then if we don't have that many questions, I can always come back to this list and keep going. But a big one is extractor fans. So on the bottom here, we have a typical extractor fan that you'd see in a ceiling. When it's not running, it's just a gaping hole into the roof cavity. Um, lots of air leakage through these. Often they're one of the worst sources of air leakage in the home. What we like to do is pull them out. They're generally just plugged into an outlet in the ceiling and then pop a new one in like this lovely top one, which has a built-in backdraft damper. And again, you can just get these at your local hardware store um, and they're just plug and play. And they're just held in with these three little tabs. So you just need a screwdriver generally to remove the existing fan, unplug it, plug the new one in um, and use a screwdriver to install it. And now you've got a new fan with a built-in backdraft damper. So the, when, I, when I say backdraft damper, for those who don't know, I'm talking about these flaps on the back of the fan. So when the fan is running, these little flaps lift up so that the fan can operate effectively. And when it's not running, they fall back down, forming not a perfect seal, but a much more restricted air passage compared to something as open as this older style fan. And then I'll just quickly jump onto fireplaces and chimneys and maybe then we'll have a look at some questions. Um, so fireplaces and chimneys also often one of the biggest sources of air leakage in the home. Um, I've got a little picture there from inside a, a chimney there where you can see straight up to outside. Um, there are a couple of kind of options available on the market here, like chimney balloons and chimney sheep. I'm not a huge fan of these products. They're not bad and they're certainly better than nothing, but I find often chimneys uh, awkward shapes like this top right-hand one has some strange angles happening that a chimney balloon isn't really going to deal with very well or a chimney sheep. Um, so often, they, you know, it's kind of a one size fits all product for a solution which requires custom sizing. Um, chimney balloons as, as well, they might, you know, um, deflate a little bit with different temperatures or if they leak a little bit. So we sort of used to use them when we started out and now we've moved on to uh, medium density foam. So you can buy this sort of, you know, from somewhere like Clark Rubber or there's a couple of other um, providers of medium density foam. Um, and basically you just measure the inside of your chimney. It can be a bit tricky with the old Victorian style fireplaces, but you want to get an idea of the dimensions of that chimney cut that foam to about sort of 20, 30 mil wider than the throat of the chimney and then feed it up there so that it's sitting in there nice and compressed. Um, and that's going to form a great kind of long-term um, solution that plugs up that chimney. If you did need to pull it out down the track to start using the fireplace again, you can. Um, might be a little bit difficult, but it's just foam sitting in there compressed. So um, there's an image there in the bottom left of it after it's been installed and another one in the center there um now i might pause there for a sec kelly did we have some questions maybe to jump to yeah we do thanks Aggie. um so the first one is about the window treatments mm -hmm. um so the the questioner was saying they didn't know that ren shade option exists um mm -hmm. and would ren shade work on a window that opens with a fly screen are there some yeah. limitations mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it sticks onto the glazing itself. Um, so if the fly screen is on the inside, then it's really not going to impact the wren shade at all. If the fly screen is on the outside, which is less common, um, then I suppose it might impact it a little bit, but only to the extent that it's already providing some shading before the sun hits the wren shade. So I wouldn't see it as a huge detrimental factor um, and fly screens really shouldn't get in the way. As long as you can take the fly screen off to install the wren shade on the glazing because the Velcro spots go on the glazing itself, then you shouldn't have any worries there. Okay, terrific. Um, there was a questioner who said they've been brought up to open the windows for at least half an hour to let fresh air in, um, mm. which can be, yeah, you know, some people's view, um, which is not good course for insulation or for keeping the home warm especially in those cooler months um what's your view about that do we need extra ventilation or are houses drafty enough i guess 
Uh, we need ventilation. It's really important. Um, uh, so the way I like to think about it is when we're talking about draft proofing is we really want to get rid of uncontrolled ventilation so that we have we, we control the ventilation when we want to ventilate the space. But yeah, it's a great point. And it's super important um, to regularly open windows and doors, um, even if you have to suffer for a little bit there. Um, especially if you have done draft proofing, it's even more important. If you've got a really drafty home, then maybe it doesn't matter so much. But if you've done some draft proofing and gotten that thermal performance, then yeah, you need to open windows and doors because now you're in control of the ventilation. Um, and so when it's really cold then maybe you hold off and you just run the heater and you you know use that those benefits um but then you need to find times where you can open the windows and get some fresh air going and get that ventilation that you want thanks for that um this one was a, a comment which i think is quite useful that there's means tested attached to um the rebates for solar yes. for landlords or, or owners and i believe it's the same as all the other rebates which is one hundred eighty thousand dollar household income and a property value of less than three million i believe but yes yeah. definitely do check the website there for eligibility yeah yeah there's a few eligibility requirements that yeah definitely need to, to be abreast of yep and um we can from my point of view we can share a copy of your presentation Aki does that sound okay we'll definitely share the recording the slides themselves oh go Someone... ahead yeah yeah, yeah go okay. ahead oh yep. 100% okay. yeah yep. yeah no the more um, they get used the better yeah terrific so tomorrow yeah I'll share some links to resources the recording and a um, PDF of the of the slide deck. Yeah. Um, and then and I've got my contact details on the screen there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Um, and someone shared that they've accidentally put on non-permanent window films, but after a few years, it's showing wear and tear. They've tried to take it off, but large chunks of the adhesive layer remain on the window. Um, they'd really appreciate if you've got some tips for removing old window filming. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, there's we often use like a dissolvent. It's like an orange. There's uh, it's kind of like got a orange brand or something. Orange powered dissolvent, which we use for sticky stuff. Often we use it for um, if we have to remove old weather stripping to put new one on, we use that to scrape off the all of the old um sticky residue left from that so i haven't personally i haven't actually tried to remove old window films like that but i imagine that might be a good way to go um, if it is starting to come off the other thing sometimes we do if you've got some strong sticky tape is use that and stick it on and off kind of like banging it with that sticky and it's bringing off a little bit more each time um, they're sort of the two main ways that we try to get off old sticky residue you could also use some kind of spatula probably not a metal one maybe like a plastic kind of spatula to try to gently scrape it off in combination with maybe some dissolvent or even some isopropyl alcohol is another one we use sometimes so there's a few options there to play with that I'd look at but that's usually our go-tos for getting any kind of sticky residues off from old weather stripping and stuff that I hope translates well to removing an old window film. Thanks for that. Um, I'll stick to another window related question. Um, so Gillian has shared that um, she has an old Louvre window in the bedroom. It lets cold air in, as we know, with that style of window. They hang blankets yep. over it. But any better suggestions? Again, as a renter, when you know the landlord may not be wanting to make uh, put in a new window or make substantial changes. Yeah, totally. So I actually, my gran has liver windows and I draft proofed them um, for her. And we just used this, uh, if you can see this kind of weather stripping here, it's like, um, we call it V seal. And so it's, it's a plastic kind of V shaped seal. In fact, I've actually got some uh, here on my desk. I don't know if my camera's that big, but basically it comes in a big roll and um, I think for my grand's louver window and you could just cut strips off to the length that you need and then it sort of folds in half and so you've got this v shape and it's got an adhesive strip on one side and so you can stick that along each of the panes of glass this also comes in clear um, there's a couple of different companies online that sell this if you um 
look for kind of VCL weather stripping. Um, and that could be a good way if the if it works with the gaps in your louver windows. Um, you can see in the top left image, I've got it installed there on a awning window. And on here, I've got it installed on a door. But basically, yeah, when the louver shuts, it's just going to sort of close. It's just going to pinch that fold closed, if that makes sense, um, to try to seal that long edge. Um, otherwise, there's also, depending on the size of the gap, if it's really big, brush might be a bit small, but you can always get a bit of brush weather stripping. They've got this at hardware stores. Um, and again, it's an adhesive backing with a brush. I tend to favor solid seals wherever you can make solid seals work, like a V seal, because generally with a solid seal, you can get some level of 100% air tightness. Whereas with a brush, they're inherently never going to be 100% airtight, but they're, you know, functionally going to reduce air leakage to like functionally zero. But um, if you can't get a solid seal to work, a brush seal is always a great alternative as well, especially as well for like sliding windows and sliding doors. We've actually got a lot of shear and sliding motion. You can go with brush seals, but um, hopefully that gives you a couple of um, feathers in your bow there to have a crack at the louver window and see if you can make something work. Thanks for that. Um, now to a heating question from someone who's renting and the property has gas heating. How would they be able to check the efficiency of that heater when there's no visible model or name or number on it? Um, so you'd want to find the location of the actual unit itself, which is going to be a big metal box somewhere um, that will usually have some kind of sticker on it with the make and model they usually generally have like a name plate and also but so the unless it's really old they also have an energy efficiency rating sticker on them so you want to locate that unit um if you haven't seen it it's probably in your roof or under the house um so if you've got an access panel maybe you can poke your head up and have a look um yeah if the ducts are in the roof then it's almost definitely going to be in the roof if the ducts are coming from the floor um, then it kind of could be anywhere. I've seen them in the roof and they ducked down to below. Um, so you just want to locate that unit and then have a look at it. And that's the only way you're going to know. You've got to find that central unit that's actually um, doing the work and got all of the information on it. Great. And they could, you know, if they can start a conversation through the real estate agent or with the landlord, just even trying to establish how long ago was this put in. I mean, it probably. Yeah, totally. Yeah, Which would give you an idea It's really as well. quite yeah. old and. Yeah, absolutely. Try to make the case for for an upgrade. Um, a couple of ventilation related questions. So, yeah. if you're removing all of ventilation, the concern about um, mold growing, and I know you spoke a little yep. bit to that before. That you know you really do need ventilation. It's not it's not about no airflow um, at all times. Um, mm -hmm. But what what does the re ventilation regulations show? Though I guess a bit concerned that it sounds good, but houses do need some ventilation. They do, yeah. And so when we're talking about these kind of DIY draft proofing things, we're generally, um, I mean, ventilation is super important. And if you make a house super, super airtight, like if you're looking at sort of, um, there's really stringent standards out there, like passive house standards, for example, where the house is 0.6 air changes at 50 pascals pressure difference, which might be a bit of a meaningless figure, but just trust me that that's extremely airtight. For a house like that, they will have mechanical ventilation. So they'll have a heat recovery ventilation system that's constantly bringing fresh air in and exhausting air from inside the house and running those air streams across a heat exchanger. So for example, if you're if it's cold outside and you're heating the home, um, that cold air that you're bringing in is getting run across a heat exchanger with hot air going out so that you're not losing all of that heat that you've paid and burnt fossil fuels well, maybe burnt fossil fuels to generate. Um, generally, with the kind of DIY driving stuff that we're talking about, we're not really getting anywhere close to these levels where you need mm -hmm. any kind of mechanical ventilation. That being said, um, this kind of DIY dry proofing can definitely have an impact on moisture buildup in the home. We're constantly generating moisture as people. Our appliances are generating moisture moisture builds up inside and we need to let it out, whether that's running exhaust fans, opening up windows and doors, um, it definitely needs to be done. So there's a, there's a sweet spot to be found there that I think is probably at the upper limit of like what can reasonably just be 
done retrofitted on a home before you know you start talking about ripping all the plasterboard down and running membranes through the walls and stuff where you're getting ultra ultra airtight this kind of stuff that we're talking about um generally things like being on top of ventilation opening windows and that kind of stuff will be sufficient to deal um with that kind of stuff but even in um drafty homes like often mold is an issue in melbourne just if you've got single glazing or metal frames on windows um that's such a cold surface temperature that any moisture in the air is going to want to condense on um but yeah absolutely it's a, it's a really fair question and something that people need to be aware of is that when you do make the home more airtight humidity isn't just moisture isn't just going to naturally leave the home as easily um, unless you are on top of opening doors and windows and that kind of stuff this is more of an issue in winter of course where we get those cold surfaces um, I mean another consideration here because really when we're talking about mold um, we're talking about condensation which is usually the big source of mold indoors um, and condensation is a factor of humidity and surface temperature so things that are actually going to reduce surface temperatures inside the home like wall insulation double glazing thermally broken windows in homes that have this stuff you can actually reach a much higher relative humidity in the home before any condensation will even occur because you don't have such cold surface temperatures that are condensing the water but in a home where you do have single glazing and aluminium windows and you've made it more airtight then yeah you do need to be on top of getting that um, drier outside air into the home when you can um, to avoid condensation buildup and mold. So hopefully that gives a bit of information around that. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something to consider. Thank you. I'm mindful that we're at our time. So of course, people will jump off if they want to jump off, but we're happy to spend a bit more time. There's some more questions. Totally, um, totally, yeah. For, yeah, for those of you who have, who have some some questions here um so also on ventilation what would you recommend is the best way to ventilate um for someone who lives on a main road with lots of pollution yeah great question um we do need that outside air in one thing that could be worth looking at is an air filter um so you can get really good room air filters um that have HEPA filter. You want to look for one with a HEPA filter, which is the kind of high efficiency particulate filter. Um, and basically they're just going to circulate the air in your room and strip out a high percentage of pollutants in the air. Um, so yeah, you, you still, while the outside air conditions aren't ideal, probably around um, your home, it's probably still not advisable to keep it closed up 100% of the time. You probably still need some fresh air coming in and perhaps a compromise there is to get um, a nice, um, yeah, air filter. The other option, if um, you have some kind of central system, you could look at what are the quality of the filters in that central heating or cooling system. Um, and then often they can be upgraded to a certain extent to higher efficiency filters without degrading the performance of the heating and cooling too much. And you could run that to circulate air through the filters in your home. Um, you could just run it on fan mode and, and recirculate the air through that while having a few windows and stuff open to ventilate. But yeah, that's a tough, tough problem to solve if the air outside um, has a certain degree of pollution to it. And we're also generating pollutants indoors for a million different reasons. Um, trying to find that balance can definitely be difficult. But yeah, there are really good air filters on the market um, and you can select them based on your room size. And if you get one that's rated for a higher room size than the one you're putting it in, then even better because it might struggle a little bit with windows open. Um, so you might want to go a, couple, a size or two higher than the room because they're sort of mainly for when you've got it closed. Um, but yeah, that's probably where what I'd be looking to if you're worried about the quality of air that you get coming into your house from outside. Thanks. There's a couple of good questions which, which we can probably do together about making the case to the landlord for these mm. changes. As someone states pretty plainly, and I'm sure it's on a lot of people's mind, you know, what's in it for the landlord to spend this money on the modifications? And as a renter, um, people can feel so 
it's illusioned because the landlord can just go for the cheapest option or perhaps even no options and I guess just to roll two questions together another one that was specifically about what's the best way to approach the landlord or agent about insulation especially in a tight rental market mm -hmm. yeah really good questions um I think when we're approaching the landlord about insulation check out the template letters that we refer to um they're pretty handy I believe the one from the the original link I, I mentioned um the template is already set up for insulation. So environmentvictoria.org.au, um, approach real estate agent landlord. There's a template letter there. That's a good way to look at it. And that outlines some of, outlines some of the benefits for them. It is, it is a tough sell, to be honest, because um, there's not necessarily a ton in it for them compared to the cost because they're not living in it. They're not paying the energy bills, but it is something that's going to have an impact on the value of the home. It's also something that's going to impact their ability to retain tenants in the long term. Rental providers don't want an empty house. It, it's just burning cash. So if they can provide a reasonably comfortable environment that's not um, super expensive for their tenants and they're interested in long-term relationships, that's something that's in it for them. The other angle is that a lot of rental providers care about sustainability and you know, that's that's a conversation that can be had as well if if they have, you know, uh, an interest in a contribution towards greener living, then that's an angle. Um, with DIY stuff, if, if you're thinking about DIY insulation as an option, then they just, they're getting a whole bunch of free labor to improve their home from you. Um, if you're getting a professional in, then you don't quite have that angle, but um, there is the option of you chipping in, like we said, for um, some rebates and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's not an easy an easy sell, but there are a few different angles, and you want to figure out what are the values of your rental provider and where are they aligned um, in terms of that. But yeah, upfront increasing the value, um, better rental yield through long term relationships. Um, and a reduced carbon footprint. Um, and if you're prepared to do some work, then I reckon that's a really big selling point because they've got you upgrading the home and they might just need to cover the cost of the materials like the insulation or some of the draft proofing stuff. So there's a few different angles there. I don't know if you have anything to add, Kelly, you're across this stuff pretty well too. Yeah, I was just going to mention that there's some good research that especially the more visible changes like solar on the roof um, do add value to a, a property. Um, and so that can be appealing to, to property owners. So sometimes just having to, you know, go with that angle. Um, and also the government introduced voluntary energy um, disclosure provisions, which means that at the moment, um, landlords, property owners can choose to get an assessment on the house and come up with a, a, a score. Um, and at the moment, that's voluntary. There's very little visibility of it. Um, I'd be hard pressed to find a property if I went on realestate.com or any of those sites that actually has these ratings that's that's to, to lease. So there's a very slow start with that. Um, and I guess I would say to, to this group and anyone else, um, it could do with some advocacy, I, I, I think, to raise the profile of that and at some point get to the point where it needs to be mandatory so that people are informed, um, not only for renting, but also at point of sale, that that's key information that people have when they're, they're making a choice about a property. There's even a longer term um, plan, I believe, to not only introduce mandatory disclosure, but also mandatory requirement to meet a certain energy performance rating. So even better, you know, that's when property owners are required to um, yeah, do the insulation, do, do whatever it takes to get to a certain level before they can either, either lease or sell. But we've got a long, we've got a way to go before that happens in Victoria. So I, I think it needs, it needs, it needs a push um, to see. Those changes happen. Um, so last couple of, of um, points, and um, particularly about the the louver windows seal. Um, so I guess a, a, a question of detail from the same person from earlier: um, Can those seals be left on and still open the windows in summer, or will it prevent um, her being able to 
open them? Does it sort of sit just on one louver and yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's fully, fully operable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. But um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't prevent the windows from operating at all. So this would sit on, I don't know how to demonstrate, but if it was on yeah. one louver like that, that's still free to rotate. Sort of like a door access. seal. Yeah, exactly. When you, yeah, have those ones that are. You yeah. just got like mm -hmm. sort of six little doors on top of each other, and you just got to put seals in between all of those panes of glass um so yeah you can still use the window completely um and i mean if i don't know if it's an option but some of the more modern louver windows that are being made today are a lot more airtight than some of the old mm -hmm. older style ones from victorian homes obviously a lot more expensive than some basic weather stripping but um potentially a long-term solution there as well thanks and the last question we've got in our q a um if um the the occupant was to accidentally damage something doing DIY in a rental property, um, would they have to pay for the repair? Is they concerned about that? Yeah, that's a good question. I would hazard that you would, yes. Uh, you'd have to either repair it yourself or um, pay for the repair, but I don't know that for certain. Maybe one to look up and provide you with a more concrete answer in the follow-up um, email after the session. But uh, my instinct and rudimentary understanding of the law would suggest that perhaps you would um, be responsible for damage you've caused to the property trying to modify it. Um, that would be my, my thoughts, but that definitely needs um, follow-up confirmation. I don't know if you have any, any ideas, Kelly. I guess it goes to an earlier point you've made about seeking permission, and I know that can potentially get very bogged down with agents and and mm. landlords. Um, but then you know you've covered yourself, and I think it would be related to basically the condition of the of the property. So you know you have mm. the condition report at the start of the lease, and then if there's been a change which is considered damage then that's something that you're liable for in the way of any kind of damage I guess mm -hmm. yeah so good to yeah as much as possible and I know it's not always easy um but to have the open lines of communication I guess like for all the points that you're making Aki that for the uh, to a um property owner who's receptive to this um there's certainly some benefits of having uh tenant who's invested enough to want to make some simple improvements. And I have heard of those sort of those success stories of good relationships mm, where yeah. the landlord has stumped up for some simple materials and stuff and, and enabled the tenants to get on and make some changes. So um, that's the end of the questions in the Q&A. Was there any last kind of slide or uh, anyway, we'll share the presentation and um, the recording. I just want to check, Aki, if you got to the end of everything you wanted to say before you made time for questions? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple things left on our sort of DIY uh, journey, um, but may maybe we'll just, they'll have to have a look at the slides. It, it was really just this one actually about air conditioning grills. So um, for evaporative cooling systems in particular, which are our kind of leakiest air conditioning system we find anyway in our audits, um, there are really good solutions like these vent covers where basically um, you can see in this top left-hand image, there's a metal collar that's been stuck onto the existing grill around the border there. And then this is a plastic cover with magnetic tape on it and it just pops straight up onto that grill. And so all through winter and the shoulder months where you're not using it, um, you've blocked off the air leakage coming from that evaporative cooling system. Um, the company that used to make uh, this style of product, they, they, um, it was a bit of a family business and they unfortunately retired, but we're actually looking at releasing, um, a, a similar style of product soon. So if you stay tuned, um, with us, we should have magnetic covers coming in the months, um, for people who are interested in that kind of thing, um, for other kinds of air conditioning, like centrally ducted air conditioning systems, um, that are closed loop so basically all this any system except evaporative cooling which takes air from outside but any other air conditioning system which takes air from inside and recirculates it you're going to have this return air grill um, either in the roof the wall or the floor and if you pop that open you'll see this is your return air plenum and we usually find these are 
super leaky. Um, so it's definitely worthwhile having a look in there. And we've got one up here that we've done some draft proofing to where we've run our air barrier tape around the collar of the duct penetration into that plenum. And then we've corked all of the joins. Um, often these are just a metal box sitting loosely in the ceiling with a duct penetration. Um, so that's something that's definitely wor worth looking at. Um, that's pretty much everything on my list. We had a bit of a chat about doors and windows. Unused power outlets is another one people often don't think about. So we actually get a bit of air leakage through these in our audits where it's basically a little three-pronged hole into the wall if it's not being used and we get air leakage through those. We just usually run around with the like child safety outlet covers and just pop them in um, and then you're good to go there. But that's pretty much all, all we missed out on in our DIY uh, journey. Terrific. Thanks for that. That's that's really great. And I guess the uh, a really, you know, low cost, especially if you know that you might only live somewhere for 12 months or less, even just going around and closing those vents in rooms you never use yes. or putting a piece of cardboard, piece of polystyrene in behind. Yeah, some I've certainly heard of people doing Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I've heard yep, of people doing, absolutely. doing yep. that and um or, or you know doing it for several months of the year and then taking them out when you when you do absolutely yeah. use them. Thanks so much. That's um Aki's details there and I'll follow up with some links of videos that Aki did for the city of Port Phillip or you can Google them yourself with Port Phillip draft proofing videos which really step you through all of the detail. Um, and just, yeah, final remarks from me uh, to stay engaged in um, more of the events and programs that we run um, to help people reduce submissions at home. Do, if you haven't already, sign up to our sustainability news or um, follow us on Facebook. And excitingly, next month, we've got a passive house um, in Corford South that's open as part of Sustainable House Day, both in person and we'll have a webinar for those who can't get there in person. So it'd be terrific to see you there. Thanks. Thanks again, Aki, for your time. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate, um, yeah, you going a bit over, over time with us, but hopefully you got a All little good. bit of value from the session. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kelly. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Hope that was a valuable.